My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. I'm your host, Era, and today I have someone on who I guess it's one of the few people where I've actually tried their products firsthand, um, really enjoyed their products. Um, and, you know, if you don't know who I'm talking about, his name is Jano Jayapalan, and he is the co-founder of Reggie's Rolls um, with his mom, Reggie. And they are a family-owned caterer that makes deep fried rolls inspired by Sri Lankan and fusion cuisine with the goal of making rolls mainstream, which is a very noble pursuit. So, Jano, uh, welcome to the uh, the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I mean, let's start from the beginning, you know, um, how did your, you know, childhood or your formative teenage years, how did that spark your interest in, you know, eventually launching Reggie's Rolls? So actually, that's that's a good question. So my teenage years, um, teenage years, not so much, man, to be honest, I was probably like an average teenager, just, you know, going to going to high school and trying to get like an education a little bit, but also causing a little bit of trouble, you know. Uh-huh. playing sports and doing things like that and not not going to all your classes so I was your typical like teenage kid growing up um I think the inspiration for getting into business and doing Reggie's probably sparked after university to be quite honest so there's a lot of pressure for me to like go to university get an education get the degree and you know complete all that kind of stuff as you know finishing that was the priority for me first and then um anything after that after school was done was was when I first was like okay let's do something with with uh business got it so like um what did you what did you go to school for like what did you go to college university for yeah so I I went to university originally I went for accounting um didn't really enjoy it was a little bland for me the first year so uh I switched into economics which I really enjoyed it's um pretty cool study if you if you get into it and do all the courses so yeah, I think that kind of helped me spark into getting, you know, started into trying to, I guess, create my own business in a sense, because um, you kind of get tired of trying to climb the corporate ladder a little bit. So, um, yeah, I was I was like, let's try something new. And like, did you go to school like here locally in the GT, like in Toronto or did you go away anywhere? Oh, no. Yeah, I, w- I went to Brock. So I, I kind of lived away for four years uh, before coming back. So during your time at Brock, like how often did you get to eat uh, Tamil food? Not often, man. <laughs> um, it the only time basically would be, I guess, first year was like all like you know uh, cafeteria food and stuff like that. But um, as I moved into like my final years, I would get some home cooking. So I'd bring that over, keep it for like a little bit in the fridge. So I have a few times where you get some homemade food, but that's about it. There's no like. There was no like Sri Lankan restaurants or or Tamil restaurants out there that you can just get food from. So your mom, Reggie, I think uh, I read in kind of your story, um, she opened Mississauga, one of Mississauga's first, or Mississauga's first Tamil restaurant in the 80s, which is pretty yeah. cool. Um, how involved were you in <laughs> and like the family with that business? And like, what do you, what's your memory of that? Uh, okay, so just a little correction. It was like late 80s, early 90s. Um, that's when they opened it up. It was actually a joint thing. They had a supermarket and a restaurant that they're running at the same time. I was kind of like two years old to three years old when they when they had it running. So the most I remember was just maybe being there like a couple of times, maybe before school or something. But I, I just have like pictures and a couple of videos, not too much because they're all on like cassettes, right? So I don't have like a cassette player. But yeah, not too many memories. My dad did say that like I would go there and like mess up the till the cash register and things like that so that's that's most of the stories i have but yeah what was the uh, restaurant called honestly i think it was like jane that's my dad's name it was just like james restaurant or james supermarket i think that's what they called it how, how long did they have the supermarket slash restaurant for i think they did it for about five years and what made them kind of get out of the business time i think because me and my brother started going into school started getting a little crazy they uh needed more of the consistent income and then I think by then there's been a few other like grocery stores and, and shops that opened up a little closer proximity to a bunch of people, like where the main population was of Tamil people. So I think they just kind of called it quits and said, yeah, let's just go to regular work. It just kind of resonated with me because my dad, I think, I don't know if it was the first, but one of the first Tamil restaurants in like Scarborough, um, 
it was a place called Rico Restaurant by like Middlefield and Finch, where the Samosa King, like right beside it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, like unlike you, I guess I was a bit older, like when my parents or like my dad opened it. Right. Was, like quite involved, not quite involved, but, like more involved than a kid should be, like helping right. like a family business. So I kind of remember firsthand. I used to eat like obviously my parent like my dad didn't pay us but like I would pay myself in like food so oh true I, yeah that's what I, I, I ate so much rolls and like portello and like oh them. portello man I loved portello that was the best I used to like down like two portellos like me and my brothers used to down like portello after portello yeah that was the best well, well eating like a fresh roll like nothing like that I still try to look for portello somewhere sometimes man. They have this other thing, and it's not the same. Uh, I forgot what it's called. They sell it at all the Tamil stores. Like, it looks uh, Brutello or something else. Brutello, Necto, one of those. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, is this Portello? They're like, yeah, but when I eat, taste it, it doesn't taste quite right. So Yeah, it's not the same, for sure. So, I guess, what sparked the idea for Reggie's Rolls? Ooh, good question. Um, I guess it was more of, like, an experience of um, growing up. I was I lived in the West End, right, Mississauga. So you're not really catered to with like Sri Lankan restaurants. There's not as many options for you to pick from, right? So the odd occasion my dad would come home with short eats from like a restaurant. Uh, I w- I wasn't impressed, I guess, because I would have homemade ones, and you know anybody's homemade ones, like your mom's ones and whoever, like everybody's mom's rolls are always the best when they make it at home, right? Because they put the time, effort, quality, uh, and they don't skip out on the protein aspect of it too, right? That's what everyone talks about. So the mutton potato ratio is key. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, basically that's why, I mean, I've, I've always been like, man, like someone needs to do something about this. We got to get like better rolls out here. I don't, I don't care. I'll pay like an extra 50 cents to a dollar. Like I'll, I'll pay. And like, I think there was similar type of like, like people were saying the same thing, right? They they would pay a little bit more for like better product. So then I just my economics background kicked in. I'm like, you know, there's not a supply of good proper quality rolls, and I'm I'm bet you there's a demand for it. So I just put two and two together. I was like, let's just try something out. I had no idea, man. Like food industry is insane. I have no background in it, zero. Thought it would be easy, um, but man, there there are tons of challenges. So like, yeah, but I'm glad I did it though. Like, so what are some of the uh, challenges? Number one, I didn't even have my food handler's uh, certificate. So I couldn't even prep food and give it to clients without having that. So that was the, one of the first things I did was get that license. Um, then, I don't know, man, it's it's the basically the same as like starting any other business, except you're just starting from scratch and you're trying to build knowledge and trying to figure out uh, what's the best way to run your operations, uh, finding a facility to, to work from. Like finding a place was probably the craziest because... I work full time. Uh, both the other partners, my brother and my sister in law, both work full time. So for us to leave that and find a location and you know pay overhead and things like that, I don't think it was like an option at the time. So we decided we need to find like a temporary measure. So we decided to find Kitchen Twenty Four, which is like a great facility you can rent out of and pick your hours uh, and produce and kind of you know run your business from there. So yeah, that that was basically. Um, Kind of how some of the challenges of like finding a place and finding funding and different different aspects like that so so how did you how did you guys make your first sale like how did uh how did you know you were onto something like obviously it's like it sounds theoretically good you know there's oh, yeah and i know that i would eat a roll like this but how did you actually go and make your first sale uh so yeah because i worked like nine to five a lot of the test runs were done at like catering to like i would just bring it in to like our workplace dinners and stuff like that and lunches and then it would catch on from there where people are like, hey, do, can I order this? Like, what? Like, what is this? I've never had it before. So a lot of it was non thumbel people, right, that were having it. So they were having it for the first time. And I guess there was a market there because you can see, like, they don't even know where to get this stuff to begin with. So I was like, why not kind of market this to everyone outside of the thumbel population? Because I'm sure they would love the product, right? So that's kind of where we tested it. We tested it with like friends and family and then coworkers, things like that. I noticed, like, I mean, uh, this is me like looking at the outside in, but I remember like when you had to order before, like when I had an order from you, it would be like a pre-order, then it would be a pickup on certain days and then you kind of go from there. Then I saw that you guys were like on Uber Eats, but I think that was only temporary, right? Or I don't know if you yeah. guys on. What, what, what was the whole experience with Uber Eats? Like, and why did you try it? And then why did you stop going on the podcast? Um, Okay, so... I guess this is a little tough. I, I don't. So basically, we do like a single product. Um, 
And when you do a single product, it's not like a restaurant that does like a bunch of different things. So you can make up your money in different ways, right? We make our money just in one way, which is just the role itself. So Uber takes a huge chunk of commission. Uh, but on top of that, to go onto that platform as a company that sells just sells an appetizer, and most people on those platforms are looking for meals, right? At the end of the day, even though we had tons of customers and loyal returning customers, it's just the amount that Uber takes from the bottom line. It just impacts the amount that we take home. And I'm just like, it doesn't really make sense uh, for us. So we got off of that. We kind of just did it during COVID. COVID was a crazy time. We couldn't really, we had number one was Uber, the only way to get our product to people. And then number two is we did those mass like delivery runs. I don't know if you remember we pick like different cities, different days. And it was just like me and my brother doing those deliveries. So I think this is, you kind of hinted at it in terms of like, you know, willing, the willingness to pay more for a good role, but um, it's like something I've come across talking to different people in like the food world and the Tamil community, but there's a whole perception around Tamil food being cheaply priced or like, you know, like for me, like when I go buy Tamil food, it's great. If I can spend like 15, 20 bucks and get food for like two days yeah. and still be full. Um, so like, it seems like great value, but the other argument is, you know, they're, it's creating something that's unsustainable because you're underpricing and your costs are going up, especially during COVID, you know, inflation, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so how did this play a part in you? Cause you know, your roles are obviously more expensive than I get at like quality bakery, but yeah. the, the return or the difference is that, you know, the, the, the protein or the mutton to potato ratio is great. So yeah. how did you think about all this when pricing, you know, your roles and like, what was the feedback you're getting from people as well about that? I mean, cause when we first started 2018, uh, I don't know if you remember, we were at a dollar 25 per roll. Uh, that was the starting price. We picked that cause we're like, Hey, we want to compete with all the other roles out there. We want to provide top notch quality, but we want to let people try it for the same price. Right. So I thought it was a great idea at first. Um, until you put in all that work in making that many rolls, like you can put out like a thousand, thousand five hundred rolls at a dollar twenty five, and then you find out that like all of it, most of it goes to like the materials that went into making the rolls, and not much was left in the bank account after. And you're like, so was it really worth it at a dollar twenty five? Yeah, I'm I'm sure it was for the customers, right? But for us, like it was just that like trial and error, like figuring out where we need to price ourselves in order to give customers a great experience with the product, but also, you know, not go broke at the end of the day and not lose your business. Um, I would say like the quality is where we strive to always have constant consistency, like the same feeling every single time. I think throughout the years, uh, we've like altered things and moved things around and tried to figure things out with the product. But I think right now we're at a place where we're very confident in terms of like what we put in time, effort, quality ingredients, spices, right? Like you're not going to get the same like experience with like just like a regular bakery that does a thousand products. We do just rolls. So we're going to make sure we do every single one correct and right uh, by the customer, right? So, um, but yeah, I know pricing is a little bit on the top end. What was the feedback like from like say customers at the beginning? And then obviously like as you significantly increases pricing as you should, um, did you notice like a huge drop off or are people still buying the rolls? Yeah, I'll be... Um... I'll be honest with you. I think when we initially raised the prices, I already knew we were going to not receive as many clients. It's kind of like the nature of things, right? Being from an economics background, you kind of already know that's like one of the, one of the, the trends that happened. So I was like, okay, we still need to do this, but let's just consider it like a reset because. This episode is sponsored by nobody. That's right. Nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. I still think we're going to offer a very, very good product at that price. And there are comparable things out there. Like, for example, like, I don't think people complain about like, a, let's say like those McDonald's value meals. They used to be like $4 and 20 cents for a combo. Now they've jumped up to like almost eight, nine bucks. People are not saying anything. It's the same combo, same meal that you're getting. If anything, it's like less filling. Right. So, and that's McDonald's like, that's not like a homemade home product like that we're trying to like put in a lot of effort in. So I think just doing those comparisons, looking at that and saying, okay, this, this is a product that will catch on. And what we decided to do is we did a lot of events. Uh, we did a lot of like pop-up events, Taste of Lawrence, uh, Toronto Food and Drink Festival. Those are like massive events where people are going for food and they're going for different types of food. 
food that they've never had before and experience and we do so well there and we're pricing it at three for ten dollars you go to a tamil restaurant they say three for ten dollars you're probably like oh man this guy is insane like get out of here i'm going to the next guy across the street for a dollar fifty right so yeah it just kind of shows you like if you can approach different markets in a certain way and present your product and branding a certain way that you can you shouldn't devalue your food is what i'm saying right for all the bakeries out there like don't devalue your food yeah there's something definitely to branding um there is a like a friend of my dad's of uh, he he used to own a restaurant in yorkville called tony baloney uh italian food but some of the customers like he would you know after hours like make like tamil food and like they'd be like oh this is so good and he would like you know i think pedipo curry you know obviously, yeah. like something thought of as very cheap like and if you go to a tamil store but he was giving them like small bowls. He was showing me and like he was charging them like 10 bucks. And they're right. like, oh yeah, let me get more of that. And, you know, for him, the cost is low. So like, it's like, like you said, same product, but different environments. You can price it differently. Like, it's like, there, there is value to branding or like creating that perception of, you know, uh, yeah. the product. So, because um, I remember like when I started ordering your rolls, I think we ordered and like, somebody's like, oh, these rolls are amazing. How much are they? And then I kind of told them, they're like, oh, that's so expensive. But I was like, <laughs> rolls are way better than like, you know, you, like go to this other place. It's like seventy five percent potato. Of course, it's going to be cheaper. You're not getting that much meat, but yeah. Um, I guess like I guess not every product is meant for everybody. For uh, sure, like you, I I just think that's exactly it. you just can't please every single customer. But what you can do is make sure you're just doing the best product that you possibly can, right? You're not putting something bad out there. So so how are like I guess in terms of like your revenue, like as a company. Uh, Because before you guys used to do like a lot of online orders and then you obviously did like a lot of festivals and you do catering. Like where is most of your business coming from? Is it still like the online pre-orders with like the pickups or or do you do do you guys deliver? Like what's that? Yeah, so it's a a mix. I think it was a good mix. Majority, I would say, is coming from our events that we do throughout the year. When you say events, what do you mean by that? Is that like festivals or like? Yeah, yeah. Food food festivals um, and events and farmers markets, things like that, that we're, we're at kind of on weekends. We've just started getting into the wholesale side of business. So large quantity orders, things like that. So we've invested actually during COVID quite a bit of time, effort and funds into our wholesale operation. So uh, restaurants, you know, bars and uh, hot tables, places that, you know, have these little snacks like that, they're interested in in buying it in bulk we can provide that oh interesting so is this like tamil places or is it non-tamil as well that are anybody buying? anybody interested it doesn't matter it doesn't matter we don't you know we don't have like a like a set target as long as it's like an establishment that obviously they can deep fry the rolls and then keep it somewhere where they can be served or it could be even just like an app on your appetizer menu if you're like one of those like a kelsey's boston pizza things like that Oh, like, I guess my question is, like, are these places that are reaching out to you on the wholesale, is it predominantly like Tamil restaurants or is it like a mix you're noticing? No, actually, it's, it's, I haven't even had a Tamil restaurant reach out once. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah. 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 It's been everything outside of Tamil restaurants. I've had a butcher shop in Pickering called Bruno Signature. And then um, more recently, I've had a South Indian restaurant in Scarborough that just signed up with us too so yeah it's just different different people when you, when you say you invested in like the wholesale side of the business what do you mean by that like did you have to invest in like special equipment or yeah yeah we we some some equipment that'll just help smoothen like our process with like packaging and things like that so it's just time right so like time is cost in these products like singular products like that so if i can just reduce that, those costs i can pass some of those cost savings on to customers and then you know what i mean it, it's a win-win for everybody obviously i know it's like obviously great to get rolls fresh hot and not like fresh and hot out of the oven but you know naturally i think of i forgot which tamil store it is on like alzheimer and like macau and canby's i think you can buy them frozen uh, is that something you guys are thinking about, like in terms of getting into retail or like selling it frozen? So like, you know, if I want to eat Reggie's rolls, like, you know, a month from now, I can kind of pop it out of the freezer, get it fresh in the oven and enjoy that same taste or. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's some things in the works um, on that side of it. Right. It's one of those things that we would kind of like to get to. It's just a lot of time goes into planning that out. And there's a lot of requirements, uh, especially if you're in food. A lot of things like licensing and certification that you need and your your facility needs to have all that before you can kind of go into retail stores so it's something in the works definitely but uh yeah it'll take a little bit of time so as a personal question for me i guess if i want to order reggie's rolls can i still do that online or 
yeah yeah so we we take mostly right now um we don't do same day orders right so because we all work full time like the owners there we don't have staff uh very much still man it's a family owned business um so we primarily work on weekends because that's when we can fulfill the orders, but we take pre-orders. So you can order throughout the week by email. You can DM us to place an order. We have a minimum and then you can just pick. We have new pricing coming out, um, which people will probably like uh, for those catering orders. So we'll be posting about that soon as well. And is it still pickup or do you deliver? What do you guys do? There? Yeah, so we pick, uh, it's generally pick up at Kitchen 24. That's like the facility. There's no walk-in. We'll just be bringing it to the, the front area there. Um, because it's like a kitchen facility, they don't allow people to walk in and out of there. Um, Where is that again? Is that like in the Topico? Yeah, it's it's North York, uh, Weston and 401. It's like kind of the main area. Um, but we also do delivery. It just depends on your postal code, like location-wise, zoning-wise. So we kind of just stick to the main GT area. Yeah, this interviewing you, I got to reminded me to eat you, like eat the, the Reggie's rolls again because uh, <laughs> I haven't had good mutts and rolls in a while. So. Yeah, let me know, man. I'll, I'll hit you up with some noise. So you, you, I know at the beginning I kind of hinted it was just you and your mom, but you kind of mentioned that your brother and I guess you said your sister-in-law were kind of involved yeah. in the business. How is it, um, obviously working with family is great, especially when everyone gets along and you know you have common goals and all that, but yeah, you know, there's like a saying of like not really working with your family or like your tier one friends because you know it's great when things work, but if they don't, it sucks in more ways than one, right? Like you have a failed business as long, along with failed relationships. So yeah, how do you guys manage that? I guess like for us, when we first started, everyone kind of had a role in a s specialization that they bring to the table in a sense. So um, I always knew I wanted to do business with family, even though they say like, you know, don't always do business with family. But I mean, for me, like I have like a very close circle. So if I'm succeeding and thriving, I also want my close circle succeeding and thriving too. So just bringing along whoever for the ride that um, is willing to do that with me and put in the time and effort. And then on top of that, yeah, going back to it, we have specializations, right? So my brother deals with a lot of the operational side of things like um, Nancy, who is the uh, uh, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister. She does a lot of like the marketing. So everyone talks about like Reggie's marketing. That's all her. So um, I don't even look at that stuff because I'm not good at it. Um, and I do more of like business development. So how to grow the business, how to get sales, how to um, improve the operational side of things with like manufacturing. So like all those little things I, I deal with. So everyone stays in their lane, everyone does their role, but everyone's allowed to suggest, make suggestions, have feedback. So I guess, I don't know, it just kind of works uh, for now. What's what's the big goal with, because like what you said right now, everyone's working full time and this is obviously a business, but like it's limited in terms of how many hours you can put in. Is the goal eventually to be able to work on this full time or like what's what's the five or 10 year goal or whatever it is with the business? Like if there's like a revenue number or just yeah. what, what impacts your life? For sure. Like, you know, eventually it is to build a team to be able to do this full time to scale the business, you know, have Reggie's brand like all over the place across the GTA. I mean, we got big plans. We're trying to go to the U.S. and things like that. So those are like long, long term plans. But yeah, so like that, that is kind of like the future goal is to go full time into it. Are there like, you know, like you said, you're a one product company right now. I know you guys like sell like some of the hot sauces and some other stuff like. As yeah. A, but is there plans to like add anything to the product line that kind of complements Reggie's roles or like along the same lines? Yeah, I'm going to keep that one a little bit of a secret if, ah. if that's OK with you. Got it. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll be watching that. All right, cool. Thanks for that. <laughs> Cool. Like, and, you know, you talked about some of the challenges, but like, you know, for somebody listening, because, you know, this is, I think it's a really interesting business just because you're putting a new spin on an old, like a, a business that, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of Tamil people that when they first moved here, like it was great having all these Tamil restaurants, bakeries, et cetera, because it was kind of like a taste, a little bit of taste of home, a sense of community, yeah. all that stuff, but they all kind of do it the same way. I mean, delicious food. Like I, I personally like going to quality bakery for like certain stuff, yeah. but um, you're, you're kind of, creating the kind of you're part of this group of like food related entrepreneurs like you know like uh what's his name Roshan from the kitchen grill and like a bunch of other guys like that yeah 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 you know, trying to put your own spin on kind of here's Tamil food and here's how we're going to try to bring it to the mainstream not just the Tamil community but yeah um so I guess for the people listening it's like like you kind of talked about there's a lot of hard work there's a lot of learnings you kind of kind of get through what's maybe like one major thing that you would like like a failure or like a learning lesson that you would tell someone that's listening that 
hey, this is, a, you know, just something that I learned or something to keep an eye out on, especially that someone that's specifically looking at the food business. Okay, so um, something that, like, for me personally was... Did you know that every time you left a 5 out of 5 review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true. But if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. For me, understanding the financial side of the food business was big. Like, even though I came from an economics background, you do math and accounting and all that kind of stuff. But to break down like food at like a cost level and bring it down and see how you how small the amount of money that a lot of these food businesses make and the amount of sheer volume that they pump out, like just learning about that process was huge for me in, in making decisions, like future decisions about the business in general, right? For anyone else out there, I would just say like, know your, know what you're getting yourself into. Try to educate yourself. Talk to a lot of those industry leaders. For example, um, I first started out and you spoke, uh, you name dropped him a bit. So Roshan Kitchen Gorilla, like he was big for us. Um, and me personally, because I, I talked to him and he's pretty big in the industry. He knows his food and stuff. So he helped out quite a bit. And yeah, just don't be afraid to kind of go out there and, and learn from the best and you know, seek advice. Where do you see yourself like beyond the business? Is it just, is this the only business that you kind of see yourself launching or like are there other plans that you have as well? Or is that kind of uh, keeping it tight on? I no, guess? no, I can, I can tell you like I've, uh, so me and my wife, we, we dabble a little bit in like real estate. Uh, so we not like too crazy. Uh, it's just been a little bit here and there. So like, that's one thing that I'm also focusing on, but not, not taking it too crazy right now because obviously Reggie's requires more of the time part of it um but yeah real estate is one that I'm like I like quite a bit and I look into that um and yeah nothing really else other than that I'm just kind of I, I have a daughter now so I'm new dad uh which takes up tons of my time uh so yeah don't really have much time for anything else other than full-time work being a dad and trying to run the business preach yeah I got I, be <laughs> I became father to twins uh, about two and a half years ago. Yeah. So Damn, okay. like you said, lo lots of fun. I mean, I think the thing about being a parent is, yes, you become, it's like weird. You, you have less time, but you're, I don't know, I feel more productive in the sense that I'm very focused on a few things before I used to try to do a lot of different things. Right. So it's like, like you said, it's like, I just got time to work on my business, be like a dad, a husband. And, you know, try to, like, stay healthy as well, you know, because... You know, yeah, man, you really don't have time for anything else once you, like, break down the hours. It's like, where else is everything else going, right? So, I mean, that's another question as well is a lot of people see the glamorous side of kind of entrepreneurship. You know, it's been more glamorized than it's in the last 10 years. Like, when I first started getting to this space, like, entrepreneurship, like, 10 years ago or even before, yeah. it was kind yeah. of on the fringe, which I kind of liked. But now it's, like, right. popular and things like that. But I don't think people understand the price you pay because often we don't talk about the price we pay because we're trying to like be optimistic and all that stuff. Yeah. So a lot of times yeah. it sucks. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I love the stuff I do, but I'm like, sometimes I'm like, this sucks. I wish I could have less on my shoulders, but it's like, wow. I, you know, but also it's like the challenge is also gives me purpose, but maybe speak about that. Yeah. Oh man. Brutally honest right now. I've had like some sleepless nights. Uh, Just honestly, during the pandemic it was crazy. Like I would think and be like, man, when are we getting our next sale? Because I got to pay rent upcoming month. Like, you know, there's those kind of days where you're just like, holy crap, what do you do? Uh, part of my French also. But so I can guess that. And then like, obviously you make, if you make a bad purchase, you make something, you spend a lot of money on something that ends up being useless. You don't end up using it. And then you're like, damn, that's money down the drain. And you got to recoup all that. So like, yeah, just hurdles, man. Challenges. That's those are the things that every entrepreneur will go through and continue probably to go through all the way up until they stop. Right? Never stops. And like, how how does it impact like your like social life in sense in the sense like like you said, you work full time, your dad, and you know you're going hard, full hard on in terms of like the business on the weekend. So, yeah. you know, like has your social life changed or like you know do like your friends and like people you socialize with do they understand or is it something that they still don't quite understand because they're like, hey, you know what? Come on, man, just come hang out for like an evening or do this or that. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's that's funny because honestly, uh, in a lot of the groups 
that I go out and hang out with sometimes. I'm known as the flop, right? Like I do like the last minute flop because something comes up and I can't make it. It's just funny. Like I've embraced the role now because I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. I think a lot of my like friends and family, like where it's close, they know like I'm super busy all the time with these kinds of things. I just think in the moment, like sometimes they'll forget and they'll ask, hey, are you coming on this day? And I'll have like the, literally the biggest Reggie's event happening that weekend and I can't come out. But it's just like them forgetting. But yeah, no social life pretty much. Like I think the most I get would be probably going out and playing my sports a couple of times a week. Make sure I get that exercise in. Like you said, keep mind and body all healthy, right? So what sports do you play? Like do you play in leagues? Yeah, I play in a, a basketball league and soccer league. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess for you looking, you know, like your life has obviously changed since you were 16, but if you're, if you had a chance to go back in a time machine and talk to a 16 year old Jenna, would like, what would you tell him? Cliche, man. Cliche, uh, answer is going to be start early. I was always a driven individual. It's just my focus always got dragged into different areas that are not productive sometimes. So I think back then I would just try to figure out a way to focus my energy on like things that mattered rather than things that didn't matter at the time. I was probably in a lot of things that were unproductive, right? Like had no value. And there's a lot of these people that are very successful early because they started early, right? They had that mindset to jump into something. So that, and probably read books. I don't read enough books, so that'd be one thing. Yeah, I think there's definitely value to starting early. But it's also like, I think um, that comes out to like mentorship. And like, I think as I guess we're considered second generation. Like our parents didn't really have time to, at least my parents, like mentor actively. Like it's more so yeah. you learn by observing, okay, they're hustling, they're working hard, you get that. But they didn't really know all these like things that I'm sure like our generation has learned. Like, you know, here's proper way to invest, here are different investing tools, here's the risks and like upside or like the risks associated with it. Here's yeah. so, oh, there's so many different things. Like I'm like, oh, like my kids will it's good in the sense that I think my kids will be like set, like in terms yeah. of college and like the, the foundation me and my wife will provide for them. But it's also like that fear of, okay, that hustler or like that hardworking mentality thing that's sometimes only taught yeah. by observing. Cause like when you see your parents working hard, you're like, there's no excuse for me not to also be working hard. Like they're doing this for me. So yeah. I have to do, or I have to deliver. Yeah. So that's kind of like my only fear, but uh, no, for sure. I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Like for example, like my parents, so they they had the business, right? They, re they they took the risk. They started their own business and then they ended up letting it go. Growing up, they hammered home to me, like study, get a stable job and go that. But like, these are entrepreneurial parents that are now giving you like different advice. So I was a little conflicted. It's like, do I, should I do a business? Because all they're telling me is, no, nah, don't do it. It's too risky. You know, you might lose everything kind of thing like that. So yeah, that was a hurdle, like trying to get them to be on board with, Hey guys, let's start the business again. Cause I think it wasn't for them. It, they enjoyed doing it at the time, but then they saw the financial burdens of it after, right? Like they couldn't keep up with it. So they didn't have the luxury of what we had, which is we could get a job, like have that stability and just put in the hours. Cause there's, you know, everyone has the same number of hours to so work and then the evenings or the weekends, like you just go all in. And this way you kind of take away some of that risk. They didn't have that luxury, unfortunately. 100%. Um, but yeah, even with like my kids, like, you know, the advice I would give them is, you know, like you said, start a business, like try, like whatever the, one of the earliest uh, the age they get the concept of entrepreneurship, hey, yeah. just do stuff. You guys have literally nothing to lose. 100%. Uh, you guys, you'll like, you'll learn because you'll go through tons of iterations of like different ideas or just learning. Because like once you do something, you learn, right? Even like the classic lemonade stand, you know, there's definitely yeah. value to doing that because like you learn sales, you learn Yep. economics of food or like in this case lemonade like how much you have to sell 100 percent, yeah yeah no i get you so looking forward in terms of your personal legacy in a few sentences like how would you want to be remembered by your friends and family Ooh, this is weird because i don't really think about this kind of stuff on a regular um i guess for me just to be remembered by someone that works hard and when they kind of put their mind to something they go after it uh chases dreams and honestly just someone that like would be there for anybody if they need it like a reliable uh, reliable person yeah i mean that's pretty much it uh, i mean that's a good way to segue into the final segment of the podcast it's called creator confessions it's basically a speed round i'm going to say a bunch of statements and you'll tell me the first answer that pops to mind ready yeah sure go ahead the first one should be easy favorite tamil food oh rolls for sure 
Something that scares you. Uh, spiders. What's an insecurity that you have? I have no idea, dude. Insecurity. Uh, my stomach. I don't know, man. My gut. Favorite show you're watching? Uh, The Office, for sure. A place you're itching to travel to? Greece. A fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Uh, how well are they known or whatever? Like just anybody? There's anybody that you want to give a shout out to, yeah. Oh, Nancel and Selvanayago. Uh, favorite childhood memory? Uh, favorite childhood memory? Probably... Money can be hard to come by, but here is a $100 opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win $100 when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? Going to Wonderland for a time. Uh, what's something you do for fun outside of work? My sports, man. All my sports. Favorite movie of all time? It could be Tamil, English, or both. Can it be a series? Like, does it have to be a singular movie or can it be like a, like a three-part thing? It can be like a trilogy or whatever. Oh, it's the, what is it, Lord of the Rings. Um, something that you could benefit from caring less about. Other people's opinions. What's a decision you've been putting off for a while? A decision I've been putting off for a while. Uh, giving up sugar. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> I, got a sweet tooth. I gotta get that. I always put it off, man. <laughs> sugar is probably worse than cocaine. I gotta get rid of <laughs> sugar. Um, what who's somebody you like to have on your invisible like personal counsel? Personal counsel. Um shoot. Probably Barack Obama. Whose life do you envy? <sighs> I don't I don't I, I don't envy anyone's life, to be honest. Yeah. I have a good one, so I'm good with that. Um when you're having a good day, what are you spending your time on? Like what's what is your like I guess or a different way of putting that is what does your dream life look like? Um, where I can kind of have the flexibility to spend it on kind of whatever I want. So with me, it's mostly family. So spend time with my kids, my wife, uh, probably go on a vacay. I don't go on all inclusive. That's probably what it'd be. Um, what's a purchase you've made that you've splurged on in the last like couple of years, but you have no regret about it? Uh, my WRX. A pet peeve. Ooh, loud chewing. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, a regret that you would have? Uh, not going back to the home country. What's a book you've read or a podcast you've listened to recently that's had a big impact on you? Um, so I've listened quite a bit to the uh, the Rise Network podcast. So they, they're like the real estate group guys. So they've been pretty good with uh, getting with educated on that side of things. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? With Mayu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayu and Austin. Uh, what's a new he's he was episode two number by the way for those of you oh, nice. yeah i think i've seen that too i've seen that what's a new belief behavior habit or habit sorry that's improved your life oh um man i'm getting older so i've been told to stretch more and man that's been working wonders like i don't i don't grunt and stuff while getting up from the couch and things like that man i'm old i'm telling you sports kind of wear you down so i have to stretch so stretching's been key for me What's a piece of advice that you'd give to your, you know, fellow Tamil aspiring or aspiring Tamil creators out there? Just take it, take the dive into whatever you're thinking. Like, uh, kind of don't second guess yourself. If you're really, you really want to go for something, kind of just do it. Um, if you keep second guessing, you're always going to not do it, right? You're just going to sit there and kind of think, what if? So I would just say, just do it. If it doesn't work out, then try something else. It's not the end of the world, right? So. Good advice. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap on the Creator Confessions uh, channel that uh, wraps up the episode. So thanks for jumping on. I don't know, man, all oh. this talk about rolls, thinking about my next order with Reggie rolls. I hope you guys as well. Um, Je you know, Jeno, if somebody's listened to this and they've been inspired and they want to reach out and just connect, um, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you? Yeah, so you guys can email us at info at Um I mean, my personal number is the one that's on the, the website anyway. So if you ever want to text, you can. That's fine. Um, give me a call if you ever have any questions, advice. doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, easy way to get a hold of me. I'm, I'm everywhere. Awesome. Well, thanks again for jumping on. And uh, for those of you guys listening. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Look forward to the next episode.